double click on that. So one of the things with brain training in general that's been been looked at before is that the specific skill you're training uh, tends to improve. But yep. more generally, it's not that translatable. But if you see improvements in the acetylcholine throughout the body, the, out the brain, you would think that that would imply that there should be some translation to other areas. That's exactly right. You know, it's a common criticism of at least certain kinds of brain training that, hey, I'm just practicing at this one skill. And, you know, how's that going to help me in, in sort of a broader daily life thing? Now, uh, let me say, first of all, that I, I think a lot of that criticism is maybe is maybe aimed at very certain kinds of brain training. You know, for example, one of the first experiments ever done way back in a, maybe 1980 or so was, you know, a person memorizing a deck of cards, right? And of course, actually anyone can learn this skill, right? It seems sort of amazing, but it's a learnable skill, right? You can learn to memorize a deck of cards. You know, it turns out if you do that, you're not particularly any better at, at, at learning a list of letters, for example, right? And, and so, you know, some of these skills are really quite specific. But the kind of brain training we've been doing here at Brain HQ, you know, there's actually a tremendous number of published papers showing that this kind of brain training actually generalizes quite well. And, and when I say this kind of brain training, what I mean is brain training that's focused on improving the speed and accuracy of information processing. Um, so studies, for example, have shown that um, people who do this kind of brain training become safer drivers, right? They have a 48% lower risk of having an at-fault car crash over the next six years after they improve the speed and accuracy of their visual performance. And you might think, well, why would that be? I'm just looking at a computer screen. Like, why would I be a better driver? Well, it turns out we can make your peripheral vision much more quick and accurate. And you can imagine if you're coming into an intersection, having sharp peripheral vision might help you stay out of a crash if another car is coming in. Right. Other studies have shown this kind of brain training helps preserve instrumental activities of daily living. These are the kind of skills you have to have to keep living in your own home. Right. Can you read a medication label? Can you, um, you know, can you read a recipe and follow it? Can you get around your house? And again, making the brain a better information processing system helps with that. And, uh, and, and that's really become quite clear now. But, but honestly, I think our thinking has really evolved on this over the years. We've been building these brain training programs for quite a long time. And often when I talk to uh, you know, psychologists, for example, you know, we think about cognitive training as, as very specific, right? I, I need to train on working memory, or I need to train on decision-making, or I need to train on attention or speed of processing, right? These are well-known cognitive domains. And I, and I get where that comes from completely. That's exactly how we thought about this when we started building Brain HQ. Our thinking has completely changed. I no longer think of these kinds of brain training programs as targeting particular cognitive skills. I think of them as improving the health of the brain as an organ in your body. And I think of the improvement in cognitive skills and reworld skills as being almost a, a side effect, one might say, of improving the health of the brain as a biological system. And, and I say that because often when I'm talking to folks, you know, we almost forget that the brain is part of the body, right? People think about the brain, they have a very psychological view, right? It's my, it's my soul, it's my spirit, it's my memory of my childhood, it's my hopes and my dreams for the future. And, and honestly, all of that is true, right? We have these rich lives and, and we should have these rich lives. But at the same time, as a neuroscientist, I occasionally have to remind people, Hey, hey, the brain's three and a half pounds of wet goo that lives inside your skull. And hey, just like your heart can be healthier or less healthy, your brain can be healthier or less healthy. And if we can build a healthier brain, well, we can, I think, logically expect that it's going to have better cognitive function and better real world function. And it turns out there's something quite specific and unique about training the brain to be faster and more accurate that fundamentally rebuilds the health of the brain as a biological system, as we just saw in the enhanced study. And it's by rebuilding the health of the brain in a biological system that, hey, many of these broader generalizations of benefits around driving safety or independent daily living skills or working memory or executive function, all those emerge from improving the health of the brain as a biological system. 
And, you know, if I can extend this analogy, right, you know, we think of physical exercise, you know, I went to the gym this morning, right, I, I like to lift weights. And of course, you know, you get stronger when you lift weights, it's pretty magical, but it happens. But hey, your whole body also gets healthier, right? You know, your, 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 your resting metabolism improves and your cholesterol goes down and so forth. And those aren't because, you know, whatever, you have a stronger bicep or a stronger leg, right? They're related to that, but they're kind of follow on effects of improving the health of your body once might say. Uh, we look at brain training exactly the same way. Speed training is a uniquely efficacious way to drive brain plasticity. Brain plasticity rebuilds the health of the brain, as we just saw in the study, and a healthier brain is better at cognitive functions and real-world functions. So it's a subtle distinction, but in our minds, we've really changed very much how we think about this. That's almost why we don't really call it cognitive training anymore. We think of it as brain training. We're not here to train a cognitive skill. We're here to improve the health of the brain. And hey, your cognition and your real-world function is going to get better as a result of having a healthier brain. But what we want to do is give you that healthier brain. That's an interesting way of looking at it, indeed. So in the uh, trial, you one of the things you ran with the, with, with the participants was uh, an NIH battery of tests, which I, uh, I guess yep. tests, tests cognition more generally. Can you talk about what did you see there? Yeah, absolutely. We used a, a test battery called the NIH Examiner Battery, which was actually developed by colleagues of ours here at the University of California, San Francisco. And, and these are tests that are designed specifically to test executive function. So things like response inhibition and decision making and things of that nature. And it's quite a nice battery. It was designed because there are a lot of neurological and other kinds of, of, uh, of diseases people get where executive function, that kind of decision making and response inhibition becomes impaired. Very nice uh, battery of tests. It's well-grounded both in theory and a lot of data associated with it. Um, we did run into a little problem with those tests ourselves though, which is that the folks we got at our study up at Montreal, many of them just did very, very well on these tests. So in the entire study population, we did not see an improvement on the, uh, on the examiner battery. But when we looked back, the reason was is that many of these folks had scored close to a ceiling effect uh, as they started the study. So there simply wasn't headroom for them to improve. So perhaps a learning for us and others that, hey, this is a great battery for folks who are perhaps impaired at executive function. But in our hands, at least with these participants up in Montreal, not a lot of sensitivity in what you'd call healthy aging. Now, that being said, as a secondary analysis, the team went back and um, when people came into the study, they used a very common and well-known assessment called the MOCA, uh, amusingly also from Montreal, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Battery. And this is often a battery that, you know, it's a very broad test. You know, you're saying, hey, what's the date today? And, you know, who's president? And, you know, can you draw some shapes and things of this nature? Um, but nonetheless, at baseline, you know, some number of people didn't score so well on the MOCA. Now, technically, they were in the healthy aging range, but, you know, you might go back to them and say, hey, you are maybe at the early stages of decline here, right? Um, you know, you're missing a few more of these than we'd really like to see you miss for a healthy population. And it turns out that in those folks, the folks who had some measurable cognitive impairment before they started the study, they, they showed a very nice improvement on the examiner battery, which largely said to us that, hey, when there was headroom in the battery, the brain training improved their cognitive function by this measure as well compared to the video games. But so that was nice to see. You know, always careful to say that's a secondary analysis. And again, this was a, an assessment battery that probably in the end wasn't quite right for, uh, for this particular population. Uh, but it was nice to see that as well. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. I, I mean, many uh, old, many older adult tests for, for like strength is sit stands test. But if you're yeah. a healthy person and you take a supplement, it's not going to make any difference. No, exactly. You're already pretty good. And I think what a lot of people are looking for anyway is already pretty good and they want to be better. <laughs> we nonetheless, need more sensitive tests for them, right? Um, and that's true with cognitive function as well. Many cognitive function tests were developed yeah, and quite reasonably, right? I'm, I'm not trying to criticize the development of these tests, but many cognitive function tests were really developed for, you know, more impaired populations. Hey, we want to detect Alzheimer's disease. We want to detect uh, the consequences of head injury, for example. And they're quite sensitive, you know, in their appropriate range. But hey, when you're working with a pretty healthy population, you know, unsurprisingly, perhaps they have ceiling effects. And there, there are other tests that are more sensitive We've done other studies. Certainly, I, I myself was principal investigator of a large-scale study back in 
2007, 2008, where we used a slightly fancier test battery that had good sensitivity, saw beautiful improvements in overall cognitive function in healthy aging. Uh, but it just goes to remind you that, hey, running these studies is hard and uh, picking the appropriate instrument is always challenging as well. Which is why measuring the acetylcholine directly is so great because you can I, just look at it. You're absolutely right. And the other thing about it is it's just, it's just, it's hard to argue with, right? <laughs> you know, I don't think there's a neurologist in the world who wouldn't agree that, hey, improving your acetylcholine levels by 10% is fundamentally a, a very good improvement in brain health. Whereas, you know, when you're testing memory and you're testing decision-making, you can always kind of argue, hey, does remembering one more item, is that really going to make a difference in someone's life or not? But hey, when you talk about reversing brain aging by 10 years, I think we can all agree that's a, that's a clinically significant improvement. And, and that's why this kind of brain imaging is so exciting to see, um, because, um, you know, again, it moves it out of the domain of, of, of psychology, so to speak, and into the domain of, hey, this is really about health and health span, right? You know, we're all living longer over time, just to call out the name of your, your very fine program here. We're all living longer over time, you know, thanks to breakthroughs and all kinds of aspects of physical health. But nobody wants to live longer and, and not have a healthier brain, right? If our brain is going to wear out when we're 85, and, and as you probably know, approximately half of people 85 and older have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's and dementia. If our brain's going to wear out when we're 85, I don't know if it's very exciting to live to 110, right? That's not the life most people are looking for. So we really need to be thinking about ways to improve our brain span um, as well as our lifespan. Or if I may put it another way, we need to think about ways that we can recognize that the brain's an integral part of the body. And we are thinking about so many ways to you know, maintain our overall bodily health, whether it's our, our heart health or our liver health or our gastrointestinal health or our microbiome health or our muscular health or our skeletal health. You know, of course, wh why would you stop at the neck, right? Why would you also say, hey, in these same kinds of ways, we need to find new evidence-based ways to improve our brain health because we want all of us to last as long as possible, but we want all of us to last as long as possible with a vibrant, happy, healthy, you know, set of things that we're doing in the world. And, and that's really how we think about this kind of brain training at this point.